Mark Gross that will tell us about uh, intrinsic mirror symmetry, please. Uh, okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to finally be at Strings Math after many years of turning down invitations to attend. Um, so I, I'm just going to start with some quick history without you know, writing much down here. I've written down a list of references. Um, so the story I'm going to talk about really begins with astrometry. I was asked to conjecture in 1996, which um, gave an explanation for mirror symmetry in terms of T-duality. And in particular, it suggested that uh, mirror symmetry could be explained by having dual torus vibrations. Uh, so on a, a Claudia X and as mirror X check, uh, should each have torus vibrations, so something like X to B and X check to possibly the same manifold B. Uh, these would be torus vibrations, uh, special Lagrangian was usually assumed. And then to go from X to X check, you dualize the, uh, these torus fibers. Uh, so this was a very vague conjecture. It still hasn't been proved it at all uh, in the degree of strength that Strangery Allen's Aslo conjectured. Uh, but it's inspired a huge amount of work, um, and in particular, sort of led to this particular chain of ideas. So one of the key things that was sort of very visible early on in this story was that when you dualize these torus bundles, somehow the complex structure on X check is supposed to be determined by some other information on X. Uh, and the usual phrase that was used is there should be some instant on corrections to the complex structure. Um, and that was very hard to make precise or to see exactly uh, what that meant uh, in the early days of, of SYZ. So the first real attempt to deal with that was a paper of Fukaya uh, in 2001. It's not on the archive, uh, asymptotic analysis and Morth's theory, uh, where he started to develop a picture which inspired many of us to, um, to try to make rigorous uh, the picture was very non-rigorous, but suggested that somehow you could understand the corrections of the complex structure by looking at things that look like tropical trees on the base following certain rules. So the, in two dimensions, this was made precise by Conceptus and Solvin in, in a 2004 paper. They threw out all the analysis involved in Foucault's paper by working in the non-Archimedean setting. And then uh, three years later, so this conservative and Solomon did this in two dimensions, and myself and Siebert um, wrote a paper which did things in all dimensions, sort of generalized the conservative and Solomon procedure to all dimensions. Um, so this, uh, both of these two, two approaches are really kind of algorithmic. They just tell you, here's a procedure uh, for producing the, the uh, Kind of the corrected complex structure on the mirror in terms of some tropical data on B. It was not, however, enumerative. But then there was some further development of ideas or that came out of understanding what was going on in these two papers more deeply. Uh, and work I did with Hacking and Keel in 2011, uh, we constructed, we gave a much more general mirror construction for surfaces, for, for um, uh, log Glabia surfaces, which you've already seen a hint of in, in Argus and Bousseau's talk. And then in uh, 2019, working with Baron Siebert, uh, we produced a, um, what I call is a completely general mirror construction. So this will not look very much like SYZ, but um, there is sort of a, a series of, idea, of ideas which tells us that this really, what I'm going to tell you, is really the correct thing to look at. And it has the advantage, once we sort of have the ideas have evolved for long enough, that it's now simple enough to explain in, in a one hour lecture. So without giving sort of any more uh, history, I just wanted to get on and explain to you the general mirror construction. Okay, so what is our setup? Uh, so, we're going to start with the log Claude-Biao case. And what is the log Claude-Biao? So, XD 
is a log claw BL. If X is a projective non-singular variety, and D is a anti-canonical divisor, which is simple normal crossings. So one way to think about this anti-canonical condition is simply that X minus D has a nowhere vanishing homomorphic form, which has at worst simple poles along, uh, has exactly simple poles along the boundary D. So here's a couple of examples. First case would you, you take any non-singular toric variety. And take D to be the toric boundary, so complement a big torus in X. So this is a standard example. And this is by far the simplest example. Uh, so usually anything you want to do, you first test in that case. Here's a second example, which is the simplest non toric example you might look at. Let's take, we're going to start with this case. Let's take X bar to be P1 cross P1 along with its toric boundary. So I'll draw that like this. Here's the toric boundary. It's P1 cross P1 and the toric boundary is a cycle of four P1s. And I'm going to take a point here and blow it up. And I'll draw the exceptional curve as dotted because I'm not going to include it in the, um, in the boundary. So I'll take D to be the strict transform. Of D bar. Uh, so this will be my running example and I'll get back. I'll actually calculate the mirror to this at the end. And just as a third example for which the construction also is going to give something useful, uh, we can take the pair P2 with a smooth cubic curve. That's also allowed in this setup. Okay, so what are we going to do with this data? So the goal is we will construct a ring which I write as QH0 XD. And you should think of this as a kind of relative quantum cohomology uh, with a zero indicating that there should be some higher degree uh, pieces of quantum cohomology that we haven't yet constructed. So this should just be subjective, suggested. Uh, and this is, which should be, the ring of regular functions on the mirror. I'm going to make this more precise as we go on, but sort of morally, this is what we're aiming for. We're going to actually construct a ring um, with some good properties. Okay, so of course, um, you know, mirror symmetry started not in this kind of case of log Colbiaus, but started with Colbiaus. So let me say a word about how we connect this to the Colbiaus case.
So to construct uh, a mirror to the Calabiao manifolds, we're instead going to consider maximally impotent or what usually in the physics literature is called large complex structural limits. So you will start not with a single Calabiao, but to a, a family, say, over a disk with some very singular central fiber. Think, for example, of degenerating the quintic threefold to union of um, um, a, a union of, of hyperplanes in P4. And we apply the construction. Uh, to the pair X, so this is now a manifold of one higher dimension, uh, and with the divisor X zero. And it turns out in this case we get a graded ring to H zero of X, X zero, with um, which should be the homogeneous coordinate ring of the mirror. Now you might object that uh, this is not a projective variety. We can assume it's, it's um, relatively projective. Uh, but in fact, construction doesn't really care. It just cares about the projectivity of the fibers and not, uh, not the projectivity of the entire space. So the construction still works without any modification. And we get this extra structure. Namely, we have a grating on the ring. And we can view that as the homogeneous coordinate ring of the mirror. So from this point of view, the log Calabiao case is really the more fundamental case. And the Calabiao case is just a somewhat special uh, case, which is usually much, much harder to analyze in examples. So it's really much nicer to work in the log Calabiao case, where we have some simple examples like that. OK, so this gives you at least a hint of where we're going. We're going to construct this ring. And for this, I need first to give some little bits of data, introduce some, some concepts. Uh, so first, I'm going to talk about the tropicalization of XD. This is now a slightly fancier word for just talking about the dual complex of, of XD. Uh, but I'm going to go through this in some detail. So let's write, write D as some sum of irreducible, com irreducible components. Uh, so D1 up to DS. So for example, here we have four irreducible components. So we have D1 through D4. And a little bit of notation. I'm going to write div dx. This is going to be the free abelian group generated by the irreducible components. And I also want to write the dual, um, the dual abelian group. So this is hom div dx into z and also the real version of that is hom div d of x into r. OK, so that's just a vector space whose dimension is, the, is s, the number of components. And I'll write these things have a basis given by the dual to the obvious basis. of div d. 
Okay, so it's just a vector space. Okay, so now uh, let's let P be the collection of this following collection of cones. I take cones generated by some subset of this basis, so subset indexed by set I. I is a subset of the set one through S, the index set for the irreducible components with the property that the intersection of the corresponding divisors, the intersection of the di's for i and i, should be non-empty. So we have a cone in P. P is a collection of cones inside this real vector space. And we have one cone whenever we have a non-trivial, non-empty intersection of some collection of the di's. And then I'll take uh, just the subset or, of, um, of the vector space is just the union of all these cones. Okay, so that's sitting inside the vector space div v of x. Dual. Okay, so uh, let's look at this again for our simple examples. So in the case where x, d is a toric pair, in other words, x is a toric variety and d is the toric boundary, as in my first example, uh, p just looks abstractly like the fan for x. But p agrees as a polyhedral cone complex. Uh, with the fan for px. However, it might be sitting in a much higher dimensional uh, space. So, for example, if you do this for p2, uh, this would be three-dimensional because you have three boundary divisors as a triangle. Uh, so this uh, is an abstract union of, well, it's not abstract, but it's a union of three cones sitting inside R3. Uh, so you lose the, the, the lattice structure uh, for the fan. And as our second example, uh, if we look at the blow up I drew here, D1, D2, D3, D4, Again, this just looks like something like this. We have four two-dimensional cones corresponding to the successive intersections D1 intersect D2, D2 intersect D3, and so on. So let me write generators here, D1 star, D2 star, D3 star, 4 star. But bear in mind, this is sitting in a non, in a piecewise linear way inside R4. So there's no, uh, no fan, uh, it's, it's not a fan. Okay, so that's the tropicalization. That's one gadget we need. Okay, so uh, we need to make one other choice. Well, this isn't a choice, this is just a construction. We need a choice of what I'll say called kahler moduli space. Now, for this, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take a cone, i.e., choose a cone, sigma, contained inside the closure of the Kähler cone of x. 
All right, so this is sitting inside H upper two of XR. And sigma should be a rational polydule. Uh, sorry? Uh, the effect here. Yeah, so it has no effect except um, this looks exactly like the same thing you get if you did P1 cross P1. It's of course going to have an effect later on and we're going to look at this example. Uh, but this is sort of purely commentarial data which doesn't capture more subtle aspects of the geometry. Okay, so um, I'm gonna choose a cone. Now normally in, in mirror symmetry, If you go back to the very early days of mirror symmetry, uh, people would write down the Kähler homology space as, as a tube domain. Um, so let me just write this down to make contact with the old language. Uh, you would write down something like H2 of XR, that's the B field plus I times this choice of cone sigma, or maybe the Kähler cone itself. You divide out by H2 of XZ. Now, this isn't, and, and then what you would like to end up with is you would like your mirror family to live over this. Now, this is an analytic gadget, and we have a hard time proving any kind of convergence for the construction. So instead, being algebraic geometers, we work kind of order by order. And to do this, let's let P be the dual cone of sigma intersect the integral homology, H to lower two. Uh, so this is, um, well, if I ignore issues of discrete torsion, this is uh, just contained as a submonoid of H of XR. And we have a toric variety, let, let's let A be the monoid ring C bracket P. So the toric variety corresponding to sigma, I'll write like that, T V of sigma, toric variety corresponding to sigma, uh, as an affine toric variety is just the spec of this monoid ring. Okay, so this Kähler homology space you can think of as sitting inside of some analytic open set inside this toric variety. And then you can use that toric variety to provide a, a partial compactification. Uh, so you end up with a neighborhood of the zero dimensional stratum inside this toric variety, analytic neighborhood, something. If I drew a two dimensional example, the tube domain would have a partial compactification that looks like like this. And as I say, we don't have a construction that works analytically. Instead, we're going to work in a formal neighborhood, very small formal neighborhood of this uh, point large volume uh, point, limit point. And the way we do that is we choose an ideal. So we choose any ideal, any monomial ideal. I such that, so I, this is a subring of, uh, so ideal in, in this ring A, uh, such that A mod I is finite dimensional, is a finite dimensional C vector space. And let's give this a name, let's call this AI. And what I'm going to do, the ring I'm going to build is a ring or a, an algebra over we'll construct QH0I of XD as an AI algebra.
OK, so we can do this for any monomial ideal. And this allows us then to take the limit. Um, we define these will all be compatible with various i. So we define uh, this QH0 xd as being the inverse limit over all choices of i of QH0 i of xd. And this will be a I should say we're taking the inverse limit over all i, and this will be an a hat, which is the completion of the ring A at its maximal ideal, or put another way, it's the inverse limit over all such quotient rings. Sorry, didn't finish the Sentence. Okay, so this tells you what we are aiming for. Uh, if you're you know, non-algebraically inclined physicist, I wouldn't worry too much about what's happening here with these inverse limits. Point is really to think of this as we're going to do a construction order by order around doing a perturbative expansion order by order at this large volume limit. Um, and of course we can't as is often the case of perturbative calculations, we can't actually prove convergence in a neighborhood. Uh, but from the point of view of algebraic geometry, that's, that's actually enough. Okay, so what I want to do is, is tell you now how to construct, for any given ideal i, I'm going to construct this ring, this module. Uh, okay, so at one level, this is extremely easy. Uh, so define QH0 I X D I'm going to, ah, I didn't define this. I need to give one more definition first. Define B of Z. So remember I had this set which has now been erased, but uh, B, B was this uh, union of, of cones, so this is uh, typical B. And I'll define B of Z to be the set of integral points in B, namely the set of things which are actually just integral linear combinations of the DI stars. So that's B of Z. Some collection of points in B. So this would look like in each one of these cones, it looks like a set of integral points in those cones. So it's an infinite set, of course. And now, I simply define QH0 I XD as direct sum over P in B of Z, all points in, integral points in B, AI times a symbol, which I'm going to write theta P. Now, if this was a slide talk, I want to emphasize that I would have used the tech command var theta rather than theta, but I just can't write a var theta. The point being that these are analogs of theta functions on abelian varieties. Okay, so what is this? This is just, I mean, there's nothing interesting going on so far. This is just a free... AI module. So the only structure of X that has come into this so far is just the combinatorics of how the boundary divisors intersect. Okay, so our goal is to put a, an AI algebra structure
on this flat AI module, or free AI module. So this is perhaps analogous when you define ordinary quantum cohomology. You just start with a vector space, namely the cohomology of X, and um, then you have to define a product which involves counting curves. And so the story is the same here. So we need to define structure constants. In other words, we need to know what happens when we multiply two of these theta functions, theta p times theta q. Well, that's going to be some sum alpha r p q of theta r with each of these structure constants, in fact, living in the grand ring AI. Okay, so that's what we need to do to define this. And what about alpha RPQ? Well, I could think of this uh, AI, if you recall, is um, right, it's the quotient of this monoid ring by the ideal I. So I could just write this as a polynomial. This is some polynomial, uh, sum over A and P uh, elements of the monoid which are not in I of um, some other number, NRAPQ, times T to the A. So this is an element of AI. So again, I haven't done anything. I'm just saying, well, you know, an element of AI is a polynomial involved a or a linear combination of these uh, monomials for A, uh, you know, T to the A should imply an I. So the key thing is to try to define what these numbers are to get something interesting. Oh yeah, so t to the a, let me perhaps write this. Oh, I just, just erased it here. Um, um, let me just do it over here, so. Here, think of c, c bracket p as being direct sum of A and P, C times T to the A. So in other words, T to the A is just the, the monomial corresponding to A and P. Okay, um, so here comes the subtle part. These numbers, which in fact will be rational numbers, are defined using a new kind, a relatively new kind of uh, girl witten type invariant, which we call punctured Gromo witten invariants. And these were developed uh, jointly with Abramovich, Chen, uh, myself, and Zebert. Roughly in the period between 2015 and uh, 2021, there have been about three or four versions of the paper, so I don't even remember when we really actually managed to do it. Okay, so this being a talk to a very broad audience, I'm not going to get into the details of how to define these things. That's usually in sort of hardcore math mathematics talks. Once you get into the definition, that's where eyes start to glaze over. Um, there's no reason to, to go into that. And so I'll give you an intuition as to, to what's going on. Uh, so very roughly, we proceed as follows. So the first thing to observe is that R in B of Z um, induces or determines a stratum XR. So this will be 
some closed subset of x. How does it do this? Well, I can write R is some linear combination of the di stars. And I can define xr is just the intersection over all i, such that a i is non-zero, necessarily positive then, of d i's. Now, this is necessarily, by the definition of b, of the, the cones in b, this is necessarily non-empty. Because uh, p consists of those cones corresponding to non-empty intersections of d i's. OK, so we get a well-defined stratum of, uh, and so simple examples if I take the stratum corresponding to the point di star, that is just di, if there's only one non-zero coefficient, that's the coefficient of di. OK, so now let's pick a point, pick a general point. Z in this stratum XR. And um, well, okay. And now define N A uh, N R A. PQ, to be the count of stable maps, uh, F from a um, curve C with three mark points, X1, X2, X out, to X, satisfying the following properties. So first of all, C is genus zero. Uh, secondly, um, F represents the class A. Remember that A, the monoid P was contained inside the second homology of X. So F represents the homology class, that's the degree of the map. Um, third thing I want is I want to constrain the output point to map to Z. All of those are, are pretty standard conditions in ordinary Gerwitten theory. It's the next set of conditions that require considerably more technology. So F has contact order with the divisor di at x1. Uh, sorry, let me insert this here. Contact order di, oh man, I should write it. P evaluated on di. So remember, uh, these points, b lies in the dual to the space of divisors. Uh, so we can evaluate p on di, or equivalently, just read off the coefficient of di and p. Um, so F is contact order given on by this to di at xi, uh, sorry, at x1. Uh, F has contact order uh, Q 
di, and I'm going to explain what this contact order means in a second, at di, at x2, and 6, f has contact order. Now, leave a little space here if you're taking notes. I'm going to fill something in in a minute. Uh, sorry, this should be with or to. At X F. Okay. So I need to tell you what this contact order means, and I have to do that in a fairly efficient way. So you can impose tangency conditions. When you have a divisor on X, you can try to do things like count curves that have a given order of tangency with the divisor. And how do you define order of tangency? Well, if you have some divisor, let's say normal crossings divisor like this, and you have a curve, maybe it does something like this, and a marked point there. Uh, so here's D1, for example, and here's D2. Then you can compute the contact order uh, of this curve at this point with D1. You take the local equation for D1, I'll say T1 equals 0, and the contact order with D1 at the marked point. So here we have the map. This is, um, okay. The red thing indicates the image of the map. The contact order at the marked point X with D1 is the order of vanishing. of the pullback of this function, T1 composed with F, at X. Okay, so in this picture, if you pull back the function T1, because this curve is maybe simply tangent to D1, the order of zero will be two. And similarly, you can do the same thing with D2, pull back the local equation for D2, and it will vanish to order one because the curve is transverse to D2. So that's the notion of contact order. So we're imposing these extra conditions. We're not just counting arbitrary curves, but we're imposing these tangency conditions based on the inputs uh, to the P and Q and then R. Now, the punchline here is that, as I said, I, I was leaving something out, is that actually the correct thing to do here is to put a minus sign. At which point you should say, what does that mean? That means a negative contact order. I'm talking about the vanishing of uh, a contact order being measured by vanishing of a, a pullback of a function. So that's really the key technical heart in all of this that takes a lot of work to define. But we have this work with Abramovich and et cetera, um, has a way of defining negative contact order. And this was the key technical innovation that allowed us to, to actually do this. Uh, so I think in the time I have, I, I'd rather sort of say a bit about the ramifications of this and do an example. Where are my time wise? Seven minutes, okay. Yeah, I'd like to do an example. Um, Wheel theory or uh, no, not, not that we know. If we, we would like that to be true, but we haven't seen anything like that. Theory of Gromp-Witten theory of curves. The, there's a usual relation in the Hurwitz theory when you impose some branching That's condition right. which looks like the contact order at the... Yeah, no, I know. At the, at the moment, we don't see anything like that. Uh, it could be it will emerge eventually. In that case, it's, it's known what, yeah. what's the yeah. condition. Yeah. Okay, so I'll try to give a little hint as to what this means by, by way of example. But let me state a theorem. Um, so the theorem is that uh, these structured constants
define an associative commutative um, algebra structure. Uh, with unit being theta zero. Okay, now, at a certain level, this theorem is obvious. If you know the proof of WDVV for ordinary quantum cohomology, you know exactly what to do. And sadly, the, the technical difficulties of dealing with um, these puncture and ground invariants actually makes it quite a long-winded proof. Um, but anyway, that, that is the construction. So let me do an example, which I promised again to go back to this example here. So it turns out that there are only a couple of products you need to look at to understand the equations from the mirror. So in this case, uh, one of the products is theta d1 star times theta d3 star. Um, so that means that we're going to be looking at curves which meet d1 ones and meet d3 ones uh, transversely, and then have some output point somewhere else. And it's not too hard to figure out that the output point can't have contact order with anything. Uh, having zero contact order with all the divisors means that the output point just maps into the bulk of the log Uh So in fact, there's an obvious curve here. So I can fix my point Z. The stratum corresponding to zero is all of X. Just fix my point Z somewhere in here. And then I have a curve that looks like that. Uh, we have x1 here, x2 here, and x out mapping as promised to z. There's one such curve. Hopefully you all agree with that. And the class of that curve is, um, is the same as the class of d4. So I can write this, uh, maybe I'll use d2 instead. I can write that as t to the d2 times theta 0. If you want to think of the theta 0 as being the identity element, I can even erase the theta 0. So that one's easy. The other one which is slightly more interesting is this product. So again, sort of completely in analogy, let me draw the two contributions here. Um, I have again a curve which meets the Um, D2 and D4 transversely, so this would be X1 and this would be X2 with an X out mapping to the point Z. And again, there's one such curve, and that curve, for example, is of class T to the D3. But now we have one more possibility. Uh, which is a contribution to a coefficient of theta d1 star. Now, what does that mean? It means we're looking for a curve that meets d2 transversely and d4 transversely. And also meets d1 um, to order minus 1. So it turns out that that means the curve has to be entirely contained inside d1. So we have this output point which we fixed inside d1, and then x1 would map here, and x2 would map here. And the way to think of this contact order minus 1 here is that the intersection number of the curve, which is d1, with the divisor sitting in, which is also d1, is minus 1, because we've blown up this this point. 
So somehow we have to account for all the intersection of this curve with the divisor. Uh, we have to account for all the intersection by putting in in the contact orders. So in this case, we put contact order minus one here. These two points, even though they're still contained in the divisor, we have contact order zero with that divisor. So the magic of puncture growth Witten theory, and more specifically logarithmic geometry, can keep track of that. So we have one curve like that, and then this contributes a contribution of t to d1. So it turns out that these two equations are the equations of the mirror. Mirror family. Given by equations, and just to simplify life here, let me write x's instead of theta di's. x1, x3 is equal to t to the d2, and x2, x4 is equal to t to the d3 plus t to the d1, x1. So here, uh, you can think of these as being coordinates on Kähler moduli space. So as you move around in Kähler moduli space, the mirror changes a bit. Um, but it's an, something living in an affine four space for any given value of the Kähler moduli. So I will s stop there, because I think I'm out of time. OK, thanks, Mark. <laughs> Okay, are there questions? Remarks? Uh, one moment. Uh, sorry, oh, uh, yeah. I think the, the protocol is you should say it through the microphone. Could you maybe cl give some examples to explain why theta functions are theta functions? Yeah, so if you apply this construction to a maximum unipotent degeneration of Iberian varieties, you'll get a mirror family, which is a family of a billion varieties. And remember that when we look at degeneration situation, we're taking a proj, so we have the homogeneous coordinate ring. So the theta functions will be sections of a line bundle on that mirror family of a billion varieties. And they are theta functions. They are the classical theta functions in the theory of a billion varieties. Uh, thanks uh, for the nice talk. I'm just trying to compare your way of thinking to the way we do in physics, the mirror symmetry. So pieces are similar, some pieces are not familiar, so I'm just trying to connect. Mm -hmm. uh, so the idea that the, what we call the local Calabia, or what you're calling log Calabia on the generalization, is what you need to figure out first, and the compact one is the red herring in some sense, similar, right, to, yeah. Yeah. similar to the way you were, you were proceeding. Yeah. Uh, that's a similar thing. The other thing is that uh, for us, it doesn't apply, it doesn't need to be Calabia at all. So I'm assuming that's the same for you. Yeah, that's right. So I didn't want to overload the talk with too many sorry, hypotheses. So um, at the moment, this ring exists as long as Kx, plus the canonical class plus the divisor, is either ample or anti-ample, or, or sorry, is nef or anti-nef, which means either it's non-negative on all curves or non-positive on all curves. So for example, you take P2 with, with any smooth divisor it will apply. Um, the problem is that if you don't have the hypothesis, this is really a piece of a yet to be constructed ring, which is not graded. And therefore, if you just take the degree zero apart, you won't have a well-defined product. So then the next thing is that in the physics, again, proof, uh, the simplest step we need to do is to find the mirror of the complex plane. That's right, yeah. Do you have the analog for that for you? Just uh, yeah, so for plane. the complex plane, so if you start with, the, if you start with any toric variety um, uh, with the toric boundary, you, you get the hori of mirror. So, you get the super, so the analog of superpotential for you is the relations you're writing? Yeah, so the superpotential, um, I was going to say that if I had more time, is just summation of the theta di stars. Oh, OK. Um, OK, thank you. Um, so what's special about uh, D2 and D4 that they get this term from minus one contact order and D1 and D3 don't? Yeah, so it has to, there's an asymmetry. We've broken symmetries. I can say that since the physics conference by blowing up something on D1 but not on, on D2. 
Okay, um, right. so, so the point is that this curve uh, has self-intersection minus one. Um, so curves can fall into it and be stuck inside it. Okay. Now, you know, if I didn't choose my point generally, so for example, over here, uh, sorry, in this one, I could have chosen the point over here and then had that curve, which still counts one. But the point is that you, know, you should get the same answer wherever z goes, so, and in this case, you can move it out. Here you can't move the yellow curve out because it, it's stuck in there. So somehow it has to contribute differently. Okay, so it's determined by where you blow up. That's right, yeah. Okay. Other questions? Yeah. I'm going to ask you the question I always ask you, okay. which is, why, why is it that in your setup, a large complex structure de degeneration is mirrored to a large complex structure degeneration? Um, I don't remember what I told you the last time you asked that question. <laughs> um, so, the, I think that the real point, if we first of all think about the log Kolobyov case, where the large complex structural limit would really mean maximum degenerate boundary. Um, the point is that if the, the boundary isn't maximally degenerate, the mirror should not be affine, but should be you know, projective over something of lower dimension. So the ring of, uh, of uh, regular functions is, is too small. So you can do this. You get a ring for P2 relative to, to you know, a smooth elliptic curve, for example. Uh, and that is the ring of regular functions on the mirror, uh, the, the properified uh, mirror to P2. Uh, but it's not very interesting because it's just a polynomial ring. Um, so to actually detect enough of the mirror in this way, you need to have uh, a large enough ring. I, I don't know. I mean, there, there are many ways of answering your question. I'm happy to give five answers, but <laughs> probably not, not now. So we thank uh, Mark again. So.